We finally reached the last story-related episode of Shane Dawson's now seven-hour docu-series on the beautiful world of Jeffree Star, which he has confusingly titled The Beautiful World of Shane Dawson. Although maybe that's just the official name they gave to the ecosystem that sometimes forms on the swampy section of his back. And I say that as somebody who has to spray mildew remover between my ass cheeks every time the humidity goes above 50%, so we're all fighting our own battles here. Although this is easily the most interesting interesting episode of the series, it's also the one that Shane tried to get out of making by pretending that audiences were completely satisfied with his boring, anticlimactic ending in episode 6, which included none of the inside perspective on the major James Charles and Tati Westbrook drama that he had promised in the trailer. So after a few weeks of receiving the feedback that his series lacked substance beyond marketing his makeup collection, Shane created this final episode, which tacks on on all the extra details in what feels like a passive aggressive response to the YouTube commentators who he was clearly watching behind the scenes. And I can see why Shane would have not wanted us to see this footage, at least until after the palette sold out, since it sort of forces Jeffrey to vaguely acknowledge that he's an online bully who impulsively harasses children, features Shane grandstanding as though he has the moral ground to defend a canceled YouTuber, and both of them throwing tantrums like spoiled children. Seems like a great use of energy. We're really coming to the end here. I wish we were all wearing graduation robes and could flip our tassels, but those things never adhere to my nipples strong enough due to oily skin. Oh well, it's still a great day for closure and another Shane Dawson installment of Clip Breakdown. <laughs> television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive in to our favorite movies, TV movies, and other content right here on the internet. And we deconstruct that like a fancy egg roll baby and look at each individual clip to decide if it has enough pigment and payoff or if it's cheap dollar store makeup from the dollar store where garbage people shop. Just kidding, that's how Jeffree Star talks. And today we are doing what I thought we were doing last week, covering the last, I guess like real episode of the Beautiful World of Jeffree Star series. There is an eighth episode, but it just contains bloopers and deleted scenes. So maybe I'll save that for a future video. This is the last one that actually matters because it's part of what Shane considers the complete story of his series. Even though, like we said, he didn't even want to do this. He wanted to leave it at the sixth episode, which to me is just like all sorts of weird and shows a lack of planning, as do these clips. Let's Let's watch. Oh, but before we do, give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see more Shane Dawson content. Don't forget to click subscribe. I have two new videos every week. Check out my merch and my Patreon for more. Now, what do you got to tell us? Should I come over? Should you guys show me the first episode? I, I don't even know how this is even structured. I mean, <laughs> we don't either. I'm actually relieved to hear that since the lack of planning was very evident throughout this entire series. I would be more concerned if you said you had actually planned for each of these episodes to be structured like a game of Jenga on a mound of kitty litter. Shane really wanted us to think that he was the Oprah Winfrey of YouTube, which like, I guess, if being the YouTube version of something means not having the right credentials. Because Oprah Winfrey studied communication at Tennessee State and she worked as a news anchor. Shane Dawson just admitted that he couldn't even put together a main idea wheel from third grade for his seven hour series. That's a problem, daddy. That's a problem, daddy, daddy. I mentioned it in previous episodes, but it's preposterous to me that Shane would have gone into creating an eight part series Series, told people up front it was going to have eight parts, but not know exactly what was going to be divided amongst those eight parts, how he was going to release the information or the colors or the details of the product launch leading up to the launch day. I honestly think Jeffrey Starr just like trusted Shane to do whatever he wanted and he didn't ask too many questions because he knew the views would be strong regardless. And guess what? They were. That's what makes it so much fun to look back on now that there is no more hype around this collection because because I feel like we're no longer blinded by the newness of it. And we can just kind of see that this was a messy makeup launch that happened to go well. We also get a feel for the creators that Shane has been watching in order to get an idea of what the opinions are of the series so far. This episode seven is like the first one that he shot and made entirely after episode six had come out. So basically the whole, the whole series is out and he gets to make the seventh episode based entirely on the reaction to that. What happened to all the drama we were promised in the trailer? He wants the tea. Spill it, Shane. I'm 
a mess. Shane Dawson went on Instagram Live and reiterated that he's having a breakdown. Hey everybody, I would just like to reiterate that I am having a breakdown, so if you could go ahead and suppress any opinions you have about my series feeling incomplete or unsatisfying. How could you even say that? Just because I'm ending it earlier than expected and not delivering on what it promised? What do you want from me? Shane won't show this part in the episode, but on the same Instagram Live, he says that he feels that the series came to its natural conclusion at episode six, and he didn't even need to make episode seven or eight. Excuse me? What kind of natural conclusion? Like dying of old age? Listen, Shane, I get it. I just said, I thought this thing was gonna be over at six episodes too, but you're the one who promised eight parts before you even knew what was gonna go into each of them, and you're the creative genius here, so there's no tapping out early, hun. I wish I could have lit myself on fire and run screaming into the ocean at episode two of this thing, but here we are. I've been suffering through this thing week after week, and what do I get out of it? Profit, attention, views, glamour, fame, but that's it. So suck it up, buttercup. I'm gonna talk to you guys the way that I talk to myself in my bathroom with the door locked and the fan on, so people can't hear me talking to myself. Oh, okay, well then that sounds like the perfect time for me to make my smoothie. <laughs> I don't actually drink this stuff. I just love that it startles my upstairs neighbors. Hope your precious newborn wasn't taking a nap up there. Ugh. So Shane continues to show clips of the strong backlash that James Charles was receiving after Tati Westbrook posted her Bi Sisters video, calling him out for acting inappropriately towards younger boys, basically, or otherwise heterosexual men who James had a crush on. While there has definitely continued to be scandals like this in James's story, he continues to suffer from these allegations. At the time of this release, the public sentiment was flip-flopping kind of a bit because at first people thought like, oh, maybe this is an, an unjust accusation. Either way, the kids wanted to see Shane's reaction to all of that. And it was conspicuously absent since it was so prominently featured in his trailer for the series, which he clearly made before he knew what it was gonna look like. I kind of want to see how they reacted firsthand when they saw that by sister video for the first time. Hey you guys, welcome to today's video. Behind the scenes stuff with Ryland because I know Ryland had an opinion too. This is bad news. I just want to see their reaction to the drama. Your response was, it doesn't matter, I'm a celebrity. So <gasps> freaking gross. Shane said, you wanted my reaction to the drama? Here it is. You wanted Ryland's opinion? Here it is. You wanted me to do my Shanene character again? Here, wait, nobody's asking for that? Why not? I had all this free bronzer sent to me and I'm trying to use it up. It feels lazy that instead of working these events into the actual series in a chronological way, or just putting them naturally into this episode, Shane ends up being pretty blatant about this being a tit for tat response to whatever negative feedback he's been receiving from these YouTube commentators, including Hannah from Smoky Glow. Hey, queen. The fact that Shane even considered ending this series abruptly at an unplanned episode six indicates that he doesn't even almost understand what makes a satisfying story arc for his audience. Because he would know that you can't just cut it off at some random point and then expect it to still work. It's a linear story, not a tapeworm. Granted, both are disgusting things that leach nutrients from my body, but that's that's why I have this beautiful smoothie sitting here. Oh. It shows Shane really freaking out while they watch James Charles' social blade de tank. James Charles released two response videos. One was a little worse than the other, but you know, both are nothing redeeming really. Also, I just don't know why as like a third party person who was watching this feud, I don't know why Shane Dawson felt the need to somehow come to the public as like a mediator or some sort of defender or of James or the situation. This is someone who has never been more than two to three years away from his most recent racial or child-related scandal. So I'm not sure why he's the family therapist in the room, but okay. I feel like everything has gone way too far. If Shane covers a drama, he'll do it tastefully. Of course, this is the person who wears tattered rags by choice and recently got in trouble for telling an erotic story about his cat. He invented tastefulness. I can't help but think that it was white privilege and cis male privilege that allowed Shane Dawson to go on being this highly regarded for years after he made content that should have made him the CEO of Bad Taste and Blackface. And the same goes for Jeffree Star and his past racist comments and 
sexual misconduct allegations. I can't help but think that a creator who was a woman or a creator of color or a woman of color would be able to go on to build million dollar beauty empires after being accused of these things. Look at Jaclyn Hill. She had harmless lint in her lipsticks and people acted like she stomped puppies to death at a birthday party. And James Charles, well, his career did fall off. He still gets millions of views on his videos. Same with David Dobrik. They're all doing fine. Where it seems like women who get involved and in even relatively less severe scandals, that's the only thing that people talk about in their comment section. Because there's so many more per like negative words you can use towards a woman who you have a negative opinion about than a man. But again, we're focusing on James Charles's scandal right now, not any of Shane's. Like we know this person. We lifted this person up. You know, people have been buying his palette. All these people have been going to his meet and greets. They dropped him down so quickly, like I've never seen before. Well, you will see it again pretty soon from a different perspective, pretty much right after tweeting that James simply needed a slice of humble pie, which uh, caused people to take another look into your back catalog. I love how Shane tells us, we lifted this person up as though all of us chipped in to get James Charles his first set of makeup brushes. No, people bought his merchandise back when they liked him more. So it feels a little manipulative to say that anyone who bought the James Charles palette from Morphe is obligated to forgive him just because Shane said so. Like since when are you the moral compass on how to interact with minors on the internet? In fact, if the issue with James Charles is about him having a kind of an unbalanced power dynamic with the fans and his direct messages, then that is the exact topic that Shane Dawson should shut the up about since he's often had pictures put online of him behaving inappropriately with very young fans back from the early 2010s. And Shane Dawson was older than 19 at that time, so there's even less of a reason to be like, well, he'll learn. Tati later takes down her video and says she stands by what she says, but she you know, shouldn't have said it like that. So everyone, the dust kind of settles a little bit, except for the fact that <laughs> during all of this, there's a tweet storm from Jeffrey that this documentary episode fails to get into too much detail on, weirdly. Jeffrey uh, didn't post his receipts. So we're here to break down the aftermath of Jeffrey Star inserting himself into this ongoing beauty YouTuber drama. Things that I went through by involving myself, I think it was a huge life lesson for me. Yes, it was. Okay, great. Jeffrey's life lesson has been confirmed by this tired looking bag of diet root beer. I think it's clear why Shane didn't want to cover this topic before the palette went on sale. Since Jeffrey kind of made it impossible to talk about this feud without glossing over the fact that he publicly accused someone of sexual assault, sent text messages threatening to ruin them with secret evidence, and then cyber bullied their 17 year old little brother without provocation and then just backed off as though it never happened. But hey, at least you learned the life lesson that all of those things were terrible ideas right before your 40th birthday. It almost feels like Jeffree Star couldn't help but use these inflammatory online tactics whenever he sniffs a witch hunt brewing that could deflect from his own bad behavior in the past. But in this case, I feel like he sort of brought the mob right to his own front door. Also, what is with the sound editing of this clip? Yeah, I uh, didn't post his receipts. So we need to break down the aftermath of Jeff. They literally stop mid-sentence. Ongoing beauty YouTuber drama. Things that I went through by involving myself. And then it just starts the next sentence with Jeffrey Star saying things that I've learned. Like, why are you interrupting the action with these? Like, no one's paying attention here. I hate the sound design. Hmm. <laughs> Obviously, since they're business partners, Shane really wants to use this episode, if for nothing else, an opportunity to let Jeffrey win back public favor for sort of inserting himself into the situation. I posted a video uh, apologizing for popping off too much on Twitter. And it's not my job to expose someone else's story when it's about something that is alleged because no one knows what really happened. Listen to this Mozart symphony they have playing underneath him while he suddenly talks like Mr. Maturity with a side of sensitivity training. Jeffrey's Star is so lucky that he somehow managed to apologize and take accountability for his actions without so much as a screenshot or vague mention of what it is he said. He must know someone in the editing room who did him a favor. Wink, wink, wink. 
After the Bi Sisters video went up, Jeffrey went public with a tweet that said, there is a reason that Nathan and I banned James Charles from ever coming to our home again. There is a reason why we haven't seen him since Glam Right Light like Guru or Tati's birthday. He is a danger to society. Everything Tati said is 100% true. Those are obviously very big accusations to make for somebody who's just, you know, just hearing about this basically at the same time all of us are. Also, there are people online who proved that Jeffrey and James had hung out since that birthday party, so he was kind of embellishing something here. And then a little bit later, Ian Charles, James Charles' 17-year-old brother, reminder, James Charles is 19 at this time, still an adult, but still young, compared to Jeffrey Star's 35 or 37. So Ian says, why does everyone act so tough on the internet? To which Jeffrey Star responded, why is your brother a predator? Why'd you really move back to NYC? Exactly. Shut the up. Like, okay, sis, that's uh, some tough love. Do you have any babysitting rates you can share? It also turned out that Ian wasn't even tweeting about the Jeffree Star situation. He was talking about someone being mean to him at school or something. So, um, you know, sometimes you just end up drawing people on the internet to be mean to you as well. It's not just Jeffree Star, a grown adult, attacking these really young people who may or may not have done the things he's accusing them of. It's also him turning his entire pretty tough toxic fan base against them. Like the people who respond to Jeffree Star's tweets are either begging for money, asking for PR because they're showing off their makeup looks or saying something negative about someone else. Even though Jeffree Star is up at the top in the video being like, it's all about good vibes and glamor and feeling happy, okay? So needless to say, right now things are kind of a mess. We're glad we're getting this behind the scenes look. I want it. <sighs> She's never cussed on her channel. I know, well, except for like sucking dick and cock. This is the moment where I ascended to a new astral plane of happiness because I finally made the connection that this is what Trixie and Katya are always referencing. And I just saved a fortune on car insurance by sucking dick and cock. <laughs> I don't know about Tati Westbrook, but I personally feel like the dick and cock binary is a societal construct. I don't think she needs to distinctly mention both. It's all going to the same place, am I right? <laughs> Why? Shane Dawson goes back to his live about how he feels bad bringing in any of that drama since it feels old by now and he doesn't want to drag James's name through the mud since in the months following all of this, things did settle down for him. And you see in the live, he's trying to highlight comments of people being like, we want the launch and the Morphe event more than the drama. The drama is unnecessary. The series was and is amazing. Girl, don't take the opinions of these nice people who just want to have, like please you with their parasocial relationship. They're not giving you the real tea. We want the drama. Why do you think we watch reality TV? That's another thing that's so annoying. Shane asked like twice on his Instagram stories, like, are you guys more interested in the business or do you want the drama? <laughs> and maybe like, for whatever reason, 51% of people said the business and he's like, you guys really seem to love the business and you don't wanna hear anything about the drama. Nobody wants to hear anything about the drama. I am confused and surprised because you said you only wanted to hear about the business. I'm like, girl, we heard too much business. It was one meeting after another. It got so confusing and it felt like I was trapped in that warehouse for six years. Getting into this drama, peppering this in even throughout the last six episodes and getting rid of some of those minutes long sentimental montages would have done wonders for breaking up this series and making it feel like it had a little more life and a little more breath in it. So you shot yourself in the foot with this. And the fact that he just threw it all into a seventh episode that he admitted he didn't even want to do just makes it more clear that that was never the priority or honestly a part of the plan that he neglected early on. But we go back to launch day where they're about to make all the products live on the website. Like why wouldn't we want to see this? And uh, the meet and greets and all of that stuff is getting planned. Mall of America on the second. You obviously know what Mall of America is, right? <laughs> Andrew, Mall of America. Okay. <laughs> Why does Jeffree Star pass around his steroid inhaler like it's a bottle of poppers at the Pride after party? This employee on the phone is like, thanks for spraying whatever drug that was into my lungs. I hope it's okay that I have a heart condition and I'm trying to get pregnant. The countdown begins with Shane as we're 90 minutes out from the launch. And I'll admit, this is where I started to feel like, okay, this is not the worst episode in the series 
because there's a palpable sense of suspense, knowing that in 90 minutes, they're gonna finally make all of these products live, that we've been watching them agonize over for all of these months. If I'm feeling it, watching it all these months later, it's very easy to see how the fans who were in it and along with the journey in real time would be salivating over buying these products. The lines at the Morphe stores that this product is released at it are like insane. I won't even go to the grocery store if there's two people in front of me. I just abandon the cart and say, good luck. These kids are crazy waiting for these eyeshadows, but do what you will. The hype is clearly built to the maximum peak on launch day. Oh my God, we look so good there. Oh my God, 130,000. For the first time ever, we're number one and it doesn't say is over after. <laughs> Well, just give it a few more months. I think you'll find yourself at a much more familiar place in the beginning of 2020. They're minutes away from launching. Shane is doing his very best to convince us that he's overcome with emotion. Two, three. Prom. <laughs> okay, ready? One, two, three. I made a note here not to say anything rude about Shane's fake crying face, just in case, you know, that's his real actual face. But I can never shake the feeling that it seems like he's trying to appear as though he's holding back tears as often as possible. Again, I don't know what's in his mind, but I usually have a pretty good read on people. That's how I discovered who killed old Miss McCready next door. Turns out it was me and I just forgot. And you know what? Not one single fake tear, baby, bone dry. I don't even pretend to be sorry. Sorry. We're 20 minutes out from launch. Thousands and hundreds of thousands of people start waiting to join the site. He shows footage of people who are vlogging them trying to buy this collection and being like, oh, I'm so nervous. Like it's stressful. I do remember situations where like you have to move quick online, like trying to buy concert tickets or something like this. So it's always sucks. I hate doing that kind of thing. So showing it from like the other creator's point of view or the customer's point of view is definitely making me feel like, oh my God, they better just buy this palette or I'm gonna lose it. Oh my god. Oh my On the my way to the window trying to get some signal so I could hopefully get it because she couldn't leave the hospital. Oh my god. Oh, Shane and Jeffrey noticed a tweet from that sick person in the hospital. She's the luckiest person on earth. Well, at least now I know what I have to say in order to get a retweet. Dear Jeffrey and Shane, I just brutally ripped out my catheter and now I'm crawling through the streets to an internet cafe so I can buy your clear lip gloss. Here is my cash app. Uh, now I just gotta wait for the money to roll in, babe. Before they even launch, Shane and Jeffrey are the number one Shopify store on the platform. By the way, for those who don't know, Shopify is a company that hosts web stores. They're the platform that hosts big brands like Kylie Beauty, you know, like a lot of big people use them because you can customize the site and they can handle a lot of traffic usually. But this is an unprecedented event. But pretty much at 10 a.m. when everything goes live, all of the websites crash immediately, which I don't think is that hard to understand. Like if you have millions of people waiting on your website and you're trying to upload new products, there's a lot that could go wrong there. And if the servers can't handle all of that, processing all of those transactions, then the end user is gonna have a confusing experience, which is clearly what happened for people across Morphe, Beauty, Lish, and Jeffrey's site seems to be having the biggest problem of all with Shopify. Get the palette, get the palette, add to bag. Your cart is empty. No, it's not. I just added that to my bag. Check out, check out, check out, check out, check out. Oh my gosh. All right, you guys. Ooh, discount. Funny. Wow, I guess sometimes the universe will just give you a naturally perfect segue into talking about the sponsor of today's video, Honey. In case you didn't know, Honey is the number one shopping tool in America, although I like to think of it as my little coupon clipping buddy that follows me around to all of my favorite online stores and helps me save money. Without me doing anything, Honey automatically searches the entire internet for coupon codes at tons of online stores, which is great because the one thing that I cannot seem to stop buying more of is face powders and video equipment, both of which tend to be pretty expensive, but also have a lot of extra coupons and savings if you have the time to scour for them, but I don't. Just recently, I saved like 80 bucks on a piece of equipment I'm using for an upcoming project, and I got an extra deluxe sample at an online makeup store that I was buying some stuff at. I won't lie, using Honey when I'm checking out makes the purchase even more fun, because I'm like, ooh, what is I gonna find? Plus, it's completely free to add to your browser. So it's really a no brainer for me. For my shopping habits, you can get Honey at joinhoney.com slash and start saving right away. Now let's get back 
to it. So after the first couple of minutes where Shane and Jeffrey are like, oh my God, I can't believe we broke the internet and it's a little bit funny, by like minute four or five, people are getting mad here with Shopify. Not that they don't have a right to, I mean, they care about this, obviously. Come on, we do this every time, you know what, you know what it is. This is embarrassing, I'm so sorry. That's me as a Pokemon trainer when I can't get my Jigglypuff to perform a trick. Come on, Stacy, show this hot professor how I taught you that song from Hamlet. Hamilton. If you had a Jigglypuff, what would you name it? Can they be friends with Stacy? As someone who's had to launch products on a website before, I definitely understand the stress of that launch day when you make everything go live. I remember when I worked for a hair brand as the brand manager, I was in charge of this entire website redesign. And so it's kind of complicated to take an old outdated website and then just with the press of a button, switch it to an all new thing with a completely different user experience and not have people experiencing bugs. So it's like we went live and then we instantly had to have the whole company pouring over every page of the site and reporting any crashes so that our technical team could go in and fix them before, you know, hopefully any customers encountered the problem or did anything that lost us money or ruined a sale. So all of that is going through Jeffrey's head right now. Like, is this delay going to hurt our sales? Are people going to have such a bad feeling about the brand that they don't come back and buy it later? All of those things could be possible depending on how long this takes to get fixed. On top of that, Shane and Jeffrey also have this other unique aspect where everyone waiting to buy the product is a fan of theirs. And as a creator, we are, I think, often in our heads, like, what are the fans? Like my subscribers, if I don't put a video up today, who's gonna be mad? And I start to picture the individual individual person getting disappointed that I didn't post or whatever. So in a situation like this, I would probably be really stressed too, imagining all of those kids like clicking refresh and like, why can't I get it? Especially when Shopify tells them that there are 2.5 million people waiting to check out, which is actually great news because it means that as soon as some people are able to buy, they're gonna be easily sold out because they don't have that many products. But for the most part, Thousands and thousands of customers are just waiting in this little virtual queue with a spinning dot, not knowing if they are going to get their product or not yet. Another one of my friends said that her and her entire family was like sitting there for hours trying to buy it and they couldn't. Well, I heard that my friend's friend's family was waiting so long that they forgot to pay their mortgage. And now they live on the streets, just using free Wi-Fi to hit refresh on beautybay.com. Things are, as the hour goes on, getting really heated with Shopify, who their people are like trying their best to figure it out, but they obviously just like don't know what's going on. But the fact that I've waited is like a year, it's not, get anything. This is so stupid, why am I crying? It's just like, I don't cry over anything. Well, it's not your fault, sweetie. I mean, social media, impossible beauty standards, and consumerism have all come together in such a way that you are getting all worked up just because of a few videos and some makeup created by Lord Licorice of Candyland and his shy friend from summer camp. Actually, not so shy. This is where Shane lets uh, some of that mm, temper come through that I first witnessed in the reality show, The Chair, back in 2015, which was the first indication to many that he is not the nice soft boy that he likes to pretend to be. He can boot some people off of the site in an attempt to try to gain access to the back end. Who's asking that? Uh, Shopify. Fix it. Cool. Can we please do I'm that? I'm not right booting now? these kids. There's a kid in a hospital bed right now with a fucking laptop. Uh, <laughs> Shit. Shane's right. If you kick people off of that website, the little girl's cancer wins. I'm just kidding. I appreciate that Shane doesn't want to further frustrate his customers by kicking them off of the site. Although the size of his reaction did cause me to rewind a little bit and confirm that Shopify didn't also suggest taking these customers out and drowning them in the open sea. Because that's the fury with which Shane hath responded. And I think Shane, you can really see, is trying his best not to let negative feelings ever come through on camera to the point where he wants to pretend like he doesn't have them. This again is all before the chair as a show was really highly publicized. So I wonder if he's really doing his best to make sure nothing like that ever gets captured on camera again. I like never get that. Don't be sorry. Watching this room's energy turn from nervous excitement to righteous indignation over the course of 20 minutes has been the most thrilling part of this whole thing for me. Also, it's a red flag whenever I hear people say, I never get mad because that's a normal human emotion. And a friend once told me that repressing their anger manifested itself in negative ways, like substance abuse, problems with food, or what was that third thing they sent me to the hospital for as a teenager? 
Oh yeah, sexual promiscuity. How could I forget my favorite one? If you're trying to make it your brand that you never get mad, it's just going to call more attention to it when you inevitably do get mad because you're a person who has the right to get mad sometime. I mean, I've raised my voice in meetings too and I've had to apologize. So I can't fault Shane for yelling on this conference call. And similarly, I have felt guilty afterwards, but you know, you move on, you get over it. At the end of the day, everyone's just doing their best. To me, I think the best thing you can do is own it and be like, I'm so sorry I got heated there. I've just been really worried about this launch and I'm worried about these kids having a good experience. And everyone understands where you're coming from and it's not like, I didn't actually get mad. That wasn't me getting mad. I never get mad. Should I say sorry? I'm so sorry for getting mad. Like, you're not sorry, you're just embarrassed. Despite these launch issues with JeffreeStarCosmetics.com, they do have to be on a plane to the Mall of America in Minnesota for a meet and greet soon, which is a, the largest mall in the country, it's huge. But they also find out that the mini palette somehow has never even made it onto the site. They never had the mini up. It's never put up for sale with 130,000 units sitting there. Basically, uh, oh my basically God. the only thing that matters Why? is we're not Me? getting proof that the mini palette is God. Don't worry, the safety team has already stress tested that glass for Jeffrey by bouncing the plastic model of a skeleton from a science class off of it. And Jeffrey actually weighs three pounds less than that thing, so we should be fine. Again, I feel for the frustration of this launch not going well, but where I immediately start to cringe is when it goes into why me? Like he's literally wailing why me when there are actually millions of people waiting to give him their money. Like why you? Right, I agree, why you? You don't deserve it. Again. I get that it's his brand and he feels like none of his launches can ever go right, but it's also like, mm, you're not worried about the customer, you're literally worried about your reputation right now. Like, and just don't scream why me, usually when it's about you enriching yourself further. There are no lives on the line. Let's all take a breath. Plus, at the stores, tons of people are getting the palette, like Morphe's site sold out, all of the walk-in stores are sold out, it's a hit. So they know that whoever did end up getting their hands on a palette from the website is going to get it, and the rest just didn't. So there will be disappointment, but they knew that from the beginning if there was gonna be a sellout. Either way, they go to the Van Nuys Airport, which I guess is where Jeffree Star's private plane is, which is exciting because that's where I took a tiny plane to go skydiving. I also saw Kylie Jenner's private jet, it's all pink. Once they're on the plane, they confirm that all of the pallets have sold out in just 30 minutes. So they do get that information from the website that it only took 30 minutes and all those pallets were gone, which is incredibly impressive, sure. And now it's time for a meet and greet, baby. That felt like a sold out landing. <laughs> See, now I feel like you're just saying sh that the whole jet has to laugh at. These people are way too polite. I would be like, what does that even mean, Jeffrey? No, I want you to look at me and explain that joke to me so I can laugh as loud as your assistant just did. That's what I thought. And then I would rip open the emergency exit, jump out and parachute directly onto the Hollywood sign wearing a pair of sunglasses. We get some brief glimpses of people unboxing their PR packages, creating looks with the makeup and blah, blah, blah. Oh, good to see you. <laughs> Shane and Andrew both seem so obsessed with Jeffrey's security guard, Roman, that every time he's on camera, it feels like they're trying to get him on the bait bus. Get a grip, the two of you. Obviously, if the hot bodyguard, Roman, was gay for weirdos, he would have made his move on Jeffrey Star by now. And Jeffrey Star would have already bragged about it on camera, so just stop. Oh, here's a fun part where Shane talks briefly about some of his other adventures of the past, which some of which we are familiar with here. I mean, I've put out things before. I put out a movie that I worked so hard on, and every Everybody at the top of the food chain was like kind of disappointed in me and kind of like I thought people were gonna buy the movie Shane oh yeah cuz you kept insisting that people were going to buy the movie since you just knew your audience so well and none of the professional feedback was good enough for you I saw that movie it was really bad I made sunglasses at one point and nobody bought them and there was like a warehouse of sunglasses <laughs> and I was like so embarrassed well imagine how embarrassed the 12 people who bought a pair of those sunglasses probably felt the first time they put them on and instantly looked like they were the guest at a roller rink birthday party. Why did Shane try to market the sunglasses that people throw away after midnight on New Year's Eve? Shane, he literally is like, people, I don't have as much money as people think. I'm bad with business, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, you also 
don't have as little money as people think because we see your mansion. And it's not about the money. I don't even care about the money. You guys know that. But being able to make something and seeing you guys wearing it, I'm just so sorry. You're saying sorry to us in an empty room. Like if you were really sorry or embarrassed about that sob coming through, you could have just re-recorded it and edited it out. But since you left it in and you want to pretend to be all coy and embarrassed about it, like I don't see how crying on camera becomes more meaningful if you try to make it seem like you're trying not to cry. Just cry. No one cares. So it's time for the meet and greet. Shane and Jeffrey gotta go to the mall. If this were my thing, I would have said, let's edit out that part where Roman touches the moist spot on my back. And I say that without any judgment because I sweat a lot too. And I don't believe in body shaming. And after all, in life, sometimes you're the person with the sweaty back and sometimes you're the person who accidentally touches the sweaty back during a hug. That's the yin and yang, as the Buddhists never said. God, they, ugh, Andrew can knock it off of this bodyguard. <laughs> Between the pen that Roman's holding and Andrew's camera, there are so many metaphorical penises swinging around right now, this might as well be a golf tournament. By now, Roman has seen the earlier episodes that Shane has included him in, and sh like every time Roman did something, there was a like, gunshot sound. So Roman is probably now seeing the camera on him, like you guys are just gonna make me look like a cartoon ninja again, okay. Also, you know he probably got a ton of thirsty comments, but it's okay. You can objectify straight men, I guess. Once you see the crowd at the Mall of America, it really puts me back at like, oh my gosh, these were really the biggest social media stars at the time. I mean, they could still probably draw similar crowds, but it's staggering to see. Also, after a year and a half of the pandemic, just to think we ever gathered in such large crowds is crazy to remember. <laughs> Shane, you have thousands of people here and you're holding a microphone. What's the first thing you want to let the fans know? I'm crying right now. You probably can't all see the tears because they're fake, but I just want you to all know how much I'm really, truly, honestly crying right now. Stop saying it. If you're crying, we would be able to see that you're crying. When we don't see it, you just sounds like you're trying to commodify the idea of crying to make this seem more meaningful. I don't think a person has to cry to seem sincere, but Shane obviously has a different idea. Oh, I'd never seen how one of these meet and greets work before. I guess Shane and Jeffrey each grab an arm and then slowly pull the child apart until tears are produced. Again, watching these kids cry over getting to take pictures with Shane and Jeffrey is a strong reminder of just how much these people meant or continue to mean to some of their audience. <sighs> and that makes it feel like, okay, I mean, as long as it's making them happy, I guess it's one thing, but there's so much harmful baggage that comes along with it. Also, so, I mean, those kids look 14. They would be like 16 or 17 now. They might have really aged out of all of this excitement. Who knows? The, a lot of this series feels like a competition to see who can act the most afraid of being in a private plane. Oh, I'm always impressed when Andrew suddenly decides to do something with his camera that ruins both the audio and video he's capturing. Like now you just got two unusable shots and no usable audio. The same way Shane went into this without really a plan for post-production, I can tell that they had no plan for the production either. If I were directing a stupid documentary like this, I would instruct the camera operator, try to prioritize getting full sentences from people. And then when it seems like nothing interesting is happening or moments of quiet, go and grab the B-roll of us all sitting or out the window or the pilot. Like I want full conversation. So prioritize getting the dialogue. That way my camera operator wouldn't be like, <laughs> Oh, let me get out the window. Too dark. What are they thinking here? Too bright. Like just think about what you're doing and then let it all come together in post. Anyway, so that's kind of it. Like they start talking about planning a restock, which spoiler alert never happens due to what they say is the COVID-19 pandemic kind of delaying things. But also I would say the interest in this collection fell off. You can find all of this stuff on Nordstrom Rack now for like 29 bucks. But you know, it shows people unboxing all of this stuff, which is in some way satisfying because we saw them creating all of this. Like Shane really wanted to get away with end ending the series without showing us the consumer's reaction to all of this nice stuff he just made. That would have been a missed opportunity. Not that he really made the most of the opportunity anyway. Also, I don't know who these people are that he's showing. It's a lot. Oh, this is so cool. Wow. Will it fit over the tits? I, I don't think so. You have huge tits. Your tits are 
What in the snuff film unboxing barnyard bonanza did they just show me? I can't stand this earnest music playing behind Rev and Shani here, rambling on like every trash mouthed couple that ever stood in line behind you in Kmart. Like there's a lot of this unboxing and reaction stuff over that song, which we've already heard many times. It goes, home. but it's like particularly a lot of these two who I don't think are particularly articulate or elegant. I, I am happy with my tracksuit. I don't want fucking makeup, but uh, I am happy. Are, are we done now? I guess so, yeah. Like what's going on with all this? Is Shane planning his next docu-series around these two characters? I'd be sort of intrigued in like a gray garden sort of way, but I also don't really like the way my house smells when they're on the TV screen. And that's not snobby, okay? I have extra sensory perception, so I'm just like really sensitive to people who creep me out. I'm just kidding. I'm sure they're nice people. I actually did Google these people. They're like really Christian and they've done other problematic things like live stream and getting car accidents on live stream. I don't know. I don't feel bad talking shit. <laughs> Obviously. The series ends with them showing us that apparently in the audience, a lot of people watching episode something were upset when they saw Shane remove this unnamed green shade from the mini palette. So in this restock, they're going to add that color back in under the name, put it back, which you know, clever marketing. In the building here, we'll be through about 90,000 of the orders by Sunday. Where are we not with the view? I have a hundred people <laughs> talking about this. <laughs> Why are we not on Ellen? <laughs> Like, I don't get it. Why is she wearing food videos? Does anyone take us serious? Those employees are like, <laughs> not even a little bit. We all talk shit about you outside of work. <laughs> Also, do you really want us to answer why Ellen wouldn't have either of you on her show? And how far into your segment on The View do you think you would get before Whoopi or Joy asked about your use of racial slurs in the past? That's a big can of worms. Come on, Ellen? These two sell out of their fancy face paint and suddenly they think they're Lady Gaga after winning the Oscar. I call being one of the 99 people who don't believe in you. That's the end of the Shane Dawson series. Woo! I can't believe we covered every episode that matters of this thing that doesn't matter. What did you think of Shane's conspiracy collection? Did you like this when it came out? How do you feel about it looking back on it now? Do you think this drama that they added back in with James Charles would have helped if they had peppered it in throughout the series? I don't really think so. It's not quite interesting enough or substantial enough from what they showed us, but you let me know your thoughts. Also, don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see me cover more Shane Dawson content. He has other docu-series. Although I know some of you will be like, no. Also, don't forget to click that subscribe button. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when we restock our mini palette. Also, I've got merch available and a Patreon where you can access exclusive episodes and bonus watch parties every single month. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you for going home again with me today. I will see you next time.